I mean, these are not slogans that we find the pride in saying them or repeating them. No, these are slogans or virtues that need to be understood and practiced. Not just thought about, not just feel good about. No, they must be incorporated within our system of life, within our system of thinking, and then they should be interpreted into action. The Prophet ﷺ, for example, gives us great uh, uh, living example of how virtues can be actually part and parcel of man's existence, of man's practice, so much so that his goodness becomes something that is extremely natural. It flows from him. It flows towards others without having to exercise any form of what? Any form of pressure, any form of formalities, any form of showing off, any... No, it, it just simply flows from you without having to put on an act of goodness or an act of righteousness or an act of virtuousness. No, it comes as a natural flow from your system to be virtuous, to be kind, to be extend help to the needy. It, it flows without expectation of anything in return. This is something that you need to keep in mind. What often hurts us as a human being? What often hurts us as a human being is the expectation for our good work. Yeah, and we expect to be recognized. When we don't, we feel down. We feel stressed. We feel depressed. Why? Because our goodness has not been appreciated by our peace. I say, your goodness has already been appreciated because it is done for the sake of the one and only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who receives that goodness before anyone else. For example, Imam Hassan sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when a poor person or a needy person would come to him, he would take a dinar, which is equivalent to a dollar for example, he places it in the hand of a poor person and then he asked the poor person, can you please open your hand again? So the poor person says, you want, you want your dollar again? No, 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 I don't want your dollar again. But I want to kiss that dollar. When Imam Hassan was asked why, he said, because now I know it had fallen into the hands of Allah. I know now it had touched the hand of Allah. Not that Allah is physical or that Allah is an ass, God forbid. No, but now it has been received by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Say this up. You know what? When we give to the poor, they are the ones who are doing us a favor, not us. Huh? They are the ones who are doing us a favor. So what happens is that Fatima Zahra, alayhi, before she used to give money to the poor that used to come to her doorstep, she used to go and get perfume. She used to soak the dollar or the dirham in perfume. And then her maids, Fidla, and all this. This is a strange phenomenon. Why are you dipping this dollar or dirham in yeah, uh, uh, perfume? She said, because it's going to fall in the hands of the most supreme. And when I want to give something, it has to be at its best. Huh? Give Allah what is best. Don't give Allah what is left. Huh? And we often give Allah what is left. You know, the, the, the torn worn shalwar kameez, we'll give it away. Huh? The leftover food, we'll give it away. And even when we do that, we are so proud that we are actually giving. But anyone would dare give his Christian Dior bag? Come on, man. What are you talking about, Sheikh? I'll leave the product for myself. I'll leave the Christian deal. I'll give the demo to someone, you know? But I'm not going to give the Nike. No, I'll keep the Nike to me because I have to go and pump the street with it. So people will say, wow, man, he's got a Nike. But who's going to look at a download? It's not good enough, right? Although you will be doing yourself a favor if you train yourself how to give what is best as opposed to be giving what is left.
And the Prophet reminds us through the ayat in the Quran in which Allah tells us, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You shall never attain true faith unless or until you pay of that you love most. Not that you love least. Huh? Not that that you love least. You give that which you love most. The one that you feel you're attached to, get rid of it. So that you will not be under the authority of anyone except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? When you are able to part away from the best thing you have, then you will become a true slave of Allah and a free man from everything else. But when you become enslaved to the world, you cannot be a true slave to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there is something that is what for occupying your mind. Bishr al-Hafi is a famous character who was one of the companions or later became one of the companions of Imam al-Kadhim. What is the story of this Bishr al-Hafi? Imam al-Kadhim was, was walking in the streets of Baghdad for streets of Iraq, sorry, sallallahu alayhi wa wa ali Muhammad. <laughs> So what happens, he list, he, as he was walking, he comes past the house of Bishop, someone by the name of Bishop. So he hears music, oh, ladies, girls singing, oh, yeah, they, uh, the Imam think it's an uh, Indian movie going on, you know? So, so he's going past, and all of a sudden, one of the servants of Bishop, May Allah honor you, is placing the bins outside, yeah, the rubbish outside. So the Imam asks, who is the owner of this house? She says, Bishop. He says, look what the Imam asks. Is he a slave or a master? What is it? She says, woe unto you. Bishop! <laughs> It's like saying, you know, Obama, you know, this guy is, you know, the richest man in Iraq, you don't know him? Of course he's a master. He said, yes, yes, you're right, he's not a slave. Because if he was a slave, he wouldn't do something like that. And he left. Now, the servant goes back, he says, where have you been all this time? I need you. She said, this funny man came outside and started talking to me and asking you whether you're a master or a slave. And Bishop says, oh, what did you tell him? He said, of course I told him you're a master. He said, what did he tell you when you said to him, I was a master? She said, he replied, yes, indeed, he's a free man. Because he was a slave, he wouldn't do what he was doing. Oh, bombshell. Bombshell hits the head of Bishop al Hafi. What happens to Bishop? Leaves his house, leaves his guest, and runs after the Imam barefooted. That's where the name Hafi comes. Hafi means barefooted. He forgot to even put his shoes on. So he assumed the name Bishop the Barefooted. And he runs after the Imam and said, Yeah, Imam. He doesn't know. He said, Hey, man. He stopped. He said, What did you mean when you say, I am a free person. If I was a slave, I wouldn't do this. Imam said, If you were a slave of Allah, you would not disobey him. So you are free from Allah. Now you are free from Allah, you're a free man. Because you can sin as much as you want, because if you were the slave of Allah, you wouldn't disobey him. From that moment onward, Bishop becomes penniless. He gives all his money for the sake of Allah. He says to Imam, can I follow you and be one of your disciples? Imam says, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرَّ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You shall never attain righteousness until you give that of you love the most. Yeah, show us. Ahasiban nas ayyutraku ayyakulu amanna. Do people think that they would live to say we are believers and they will not be put to the trials and test? No, they have to be put to the trials and so they could get connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. By doing so, nothing becomes important to you anymore. Abu Dhar was asked, Oh Abu Dhar, why do we hate the hereafter and love the dunya? A valid question, huh? No one, everyone says in the layali of Qadr, Oh Allah, prolong my life. No one says, Oh Allah, shorten my life. I'd love to meet you. 
right? Of course, all of us want to meet Allah, but still we want to live, right? And we want to live longer. So he said, why? Abu Dhar said, because people by nature do not like to move from a place which is built to a place which is ruined. And you have built your dunya and ruined your akhirah. So why would you want to move from dunya to akhirah? You've already ruined your akhirah. Why would you want to go? But if you have already built your akhirah, you can't wait to get to akhirah. Imam Ali described a group of people by saying what? There are a group of people among you who have so much faith in them that their souls are eager and yearning to jump out of their body and the only thing that keeps their souls within their body is the specific period that Allah has nominated for them to live in this world. Had it not been that they had to live this period of time in this world, their soul would have already left their bodies in anticipation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because they've already constructed their akhir. It is funny, brothers and sisters, that how we are the ones who either make or break our outcome in the hereafter. The Prophet, when he was taken into the uh, journey of ascension, it's called Al-Mi'raj, you know, he's taken into heaven, he's escorted by Jibra'il uh, on a tour to see Jannah. So all of a sudden the Prophet notices Malaika working and then they're sitting down. Then all of a sudden they resume work, then they sit down. Then they resume work, then they sit down. And then all of a sudden there is no more material left. Like there's no bricks, there is no more. Of course the bricks of Jannah are made from gold and silver and rubies and pearls, not your average, you know, sandstone and what have you in this one. But these rubies and stones all of a sudden become what? Become non-existence. So that caught the attention of Rasulullah. He said, oh Jibra'il, what's going on? He said, these malaika are out of building material. He said, how? This is Jannah. How is it possible that, that they are out of building material? He said, because the, mil the building material of Malaika are the good actions of people. Once they stop, there's nothing to build. So if you go to Jannah and you find the window missing, don't blame Allah. Huh? You've been neglectful in one of these avenues of goodness. Huh? But of course Allah will complement it with his own infinite wisdom and giving. But if you come across something missing, do not blame anyone. Let's blame ourselves for being negligent when an opportunity came to give and we held back. Look what Imam Hussein says in that regard. He says, In hawa'i jannas min ni'amillahi alaykum fala tamallu ni'am. Allah. People's need when they come to you are God's blessing coming down on you. So don't despair and give up on people's need when they come to you because they are the blessings of Allah. You know, someone looks at your door, for the sake of Allah, you give. Second, for the sake of Allah, you give. Third, ah, for the sake of Allah until when? This is a blessing coming to you. Allah is saying when people come and ask you for help, whether it is financial, whether it is intellectual, whether it is physical, it is because Allah is blessing you with people coming to you. Blessing you. He is not depriving you of his blessing. So what we need, we know that one of the most significant differences between man and other living beings is the moral and the socio-moral aspect as we have been saying so far. So let us understand more and further what it's meant when we talk about sanction for the principles of morality as we have been saying that we don't want lustrous slogans but we want these virtues to become incarnate within us. Yeah, and if someone asks, what is virtue? They will say it's Muhammad, or it's Ali, or it is uh, Mr. Chandu, or it is Mr. Uh, you know, uh, whatever, okay, Ali Bai, or Mr. Uh, Himraj, or whatever that is made. Huh? If you ask what is goodness, it can be represented in a person, in a person. 
right? And that's why we need to uh, uh, introduce into our own system. These are the virtues without which not only life will lose its order and normality, but it is very likely to be turned into chaos. Of course it is possible, however, as I have been saying, to acquire these moral and social qualities without the aid of religion, someone may argue. But certainly, in the absence of a firm religious belief, these values appear to lose their meaning and become a series of mean, unbinding recommendation because in such a case they do not amount to more than a piece of advice from a close friend in respect of which we are at full liberty to accept or reject right because there is nothing to bind us to it do good oh why why do i have to do good because goodness can give you one two three well i don't want it huh but when you know that you are reporting to duty before Allah, then it's a different story. There's a, complete, there's a firm belief system. I'll show you how the belief system works. In 1967 or 64, I'm not sure, one of these dates, there was a major blackout in New York City. Okay? Now, we talk about a civilized nation, civilized community, educated people, people who have these moral virtues, right? The blackout lasted six hours. There was 250,000 reported theft. But you are people are civil. Huh? You are civil. What makes you go down? And some of them don't need to steal. Huh? Don't need to steal. There are some Hollywood stars who are caught stealing, right? And these people can can sustain the whole of Africa with their money, right? Yet they find it in their system to go and steal. Why? Because there is nothing to bind them to a system. It's me recommendation that I'm at liberty to accept or reject, right? But the same blackout happened a few days later or a few years later in Egypt poorest country, second or third poorest country in the world at that time. What happened? How many reported theft took place in Egypt? The same amount of blackout, six hours. 37 reported incidents of theft. Compared to 250,000. Why? Because there is a system working at hand. What is that system? The most corrupt security system is in Egypt. Right? But there is the perfect system of security God called what? God consciousness. Huh? God consciousness. Like the Prophet says to Imam Ali and to the Muslims, he said, Worship Allah as if he is in front of you. But since you are unable to see your Allah because of your limitation, then make sure that you believe that He is watching over you. When you worship Him, know that He is watching you. He knows every single movement that you are doing. Not only every single movement, He knows every thought that is going through your mind. Every thought that is going through your mind. And that's why we need religion to bind us to that belief system that gives me that dictate to remain steadfast in as far as my virtues is concerned. Because I don't report to anyone on earth. I only report to heaven. I only report to heaven. And that is what we need to educate our kids and our teenagers and our youth. I don't need when I speak to my daughters or my son to tell him, you know what, I will be angry if you broke the house rules. Who are you for you to get angry at your children if they break the house rules? Link your children to Allah, not to you. Because one day you will not be around for them. Right? You will not be around for them. So let them not overlook their shoulders because they think you are standing at the gate of the school. And once you disappear, come on guys, let's flirt. 
right? No. Let's flirt. There is no question of flirting. Why? Because now I'm linked with my internal system to the watchful eye of Allah, not to my parents. I don't report to my parents. I report to my God. I don't want to lose connectivity with Him, not because I'm afraid of hell's hellfire. No, that's another concept we should wipe out. Like Imam Ali says, Oh Allah, I did not worship you out of greed for your paradise or out of fear of your hellfire, but I worshipped you because you were worthy of being worshipped, so I turned to you. Allah. You are worthy! Whether there is Jannah or Nar, who cares? As long as I'm connected to you, oh Allah, that's what makes me want to be in affinity with you. Just like, you know, when two head young, beautiful, you know, lovers in a halal way. Don't get ideas. Ah, the chef is giving fatwa to become a lover. No, you can't. But in a halal way, you know, you get engaged and you know, the best time of your life is at that particular time, right? Because what connects you to that person? What is it? Is it fee? Is it hope? Or is it that me chemistry? That me connection that you synchronize with one another? So much so that if your bride to be tells you, why do you report to duty always at six o'clock at night? Yeah, he come at four. When she says that to you, you will come at Fajr Namaz. Why? Why? Because you want to impress. No. Because you are frightened that she will barbecue you. She can't. But I'll tell you what you're afraid of. You're afraid that she may disconnect you. She says, listen, you, 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 look, I've given you ample chance. I don't want to see your face anymore. No, why? Please. Huh? All I want to do it again. She doesn't have the means to get to you except what? Through disconnecting you, right? And then Amir al-Mu'mineen comes to tell us about this disconnection in Dua Qumayn. He says, Hab anni sabartu ala Let's say perchance, O oh Allah, that I bear the torment of your hellfire. But how can I bear the torment of your separation? Huh? How can I bear? the torment of being separated from you. Put me in hellfire, but let me be connected to you, I'll be satisfied. But don't sever this connection, because you are the source of my existence. And without you, I become a non-entity. I become a non-entity. And that's why we say connection on the basis of love is far more greater than connecting on the basis of fear. Because the moment that fear goes, there is no more connection, right? The first thing you want to leave behind is what? Is God. And often that's what happened with our kids. The first thing they leave behind when they go to college is what? Is God and religion. Why? Because it has been taught to them in a horrible way. You break a glass, God is gonna barbecue. Damn it, over the glass! He's gonna barbecue me. Then what will he do if I kill someone? What he will do if I, you know, usurp the right of someone or take his money? If it's over a glass, he's gonna kill me. Then can you imagine if I do something more severe? Then I don't wanna know that God. And I don't wanna be party to that God. And I don't want to be in affinity to that God. You know, next door to you, there is a country called Bangladesh, right? It was part of your country. There was a writer who became later on the, the most, you know, advocate against Islam. Why? She hates Islam. She wrote books against Islam. And in one of the CNN interviews, one of the people who was interviewing her, he says, what made you turn against your faith and think that your faith is not right? She said, my mom. Whoa. The man says, how? She said, from until I reached the age of 14, every time I told a lie, my mother used to tell me, God is going to cut your tongue. So I used to go every day into the bathroom to see, is my tongue still there or not? When I realized by the age of 14 that my tongue is still there, I knew God was not there. Achieve. Why? Because he didn't cut her tongue. 
That means he doesn't exist. Because that's what she thought God is all about. Due to the way that her mother approached the question of God. It came from the perspective of fear. No, your parent, your children tell lies and you want to stop them? Don't tell them you're a liar. Tell them lie and Allah loves the truthful. Leave it at that. Don't tell them God is gonna, you know, put charcoal and melted copper in your ears. And melted copper in your mouth. So much so that it's gonna come out of your brain. Wow, now what's this scream for? What's this? They're living dead. I don't want to be party to this. Is this exorcist? No, I don't want this. I don't want to know that God. I want to know a God that loves. I know a God that can reach out to people. Like he reached out to us in the Quran when he said, in the beginning of every surah except for one. What did he say? In the name of God, the mighty, the powerful. Wallah, he didn't say that. He said, in the name of God, the merciful, the most merciful. Oh, he repeated it 40, well, how many times? He repeated it 114 times. Because the one that is missing in Surah Bara'a is replaced in Surah An-Naml. <laughs> Subhanallah. So Allah wants to emphasize, you know what? Every time you hold the Quran, remember, relate to me from the question of mercy and love. I am the most merciful, the most merciful, the most merciful, the most merciful. And there is no one as merciful to you as I am. Not even your own mother. The Prophet says what in one of the hadith? By Allah, my God is more merciful towards his creatures than a mother to her infant suckling child. You know how much a mother has love to her child? He says, no. God is even closer to you than your mother who suckles you at that particular time of your growing up. God is more than that. I don't know the time. Finish? Oh, keep going. So these qualities, brothers and sisters, do what? These qualities are rather based on an internal feeling and faith that are naturally beyond the scope of ordinary law. Why? Because once the man-made law comes out of our lives and there is nothing to sustain us from a spiritual perspective on the question of morality, we will give up on the law. We will find it an opportunity to be who, who we are. Right? Sometimes, you know, in some countries you see people are so civil, they act in a perfect way. Give them the opportunity to take the law away you will see the true nature of behavior. You will see how they behave. Why? Because there is nothing to sustain that moral God. God is not in their presence. And I will prove it to you. How? Can you see it? Oh, wow. Well, I've been promoted today. Salawat is so low. So what happens in Canada, Toronto University, who studied at Toronto University? Anyone? Okay. Toronto University reports that they made a survey. I'll give you the reference of the survey. I've got it in my notes. What does this survey do? The survey realized that there is a lot of attack on female students. So they said, let's see, do we really have a problem? Let's ask the students. So they sent out a survey to the male students of Toronto University. The whole survey is one question. What is the question? Given the opportunity to rape someone without being caught, yeah, and if the law doesn't get to you, would you do it? 67% said yes. Six, this is the civil world that we want to emulate and we want to follow. The West is what is the beacon of civilization. This is civilization. 67% say given the opportunity to rape, we will do it. 
Subhanallah. So what did Toronto University do after that? They were horrified. They started producing mini buses to escort girls from one campus to another. Because there is a danger for these girls, subhanAllah. And Allah, you know what He says? He says in Surah Al-Ahzab about those <laughs> On the basis, the ayah reads literally, so that on the basis of their modesty, people see how modest they are, they will not go near them. They will go, you know, in the West, in Australia, for example, you see some of our sisters, you know, they are dressing in formal hijab or whatever. Wallah, I've observed that Australian boys, when they see them, they step out, they go back to them. You know? But when someone comes with, you know, the fake eyelashes, with the acrylics, with the red long, I don't know what, mascara, the crack up on them, huh? and the way they hint at them, show sure, what's the beauty doing today? Where are you chilling out? Can we chill together? Beautiful. Huh? SubhanAllah. This is what happens. Huh? Whether we want to realize it or not. Whether we want to realize it or not. It is happening. Right? It is happening. Modesty is of profound importance. In the, and modesty not for girls only. Modesty for men. Because they are the problem at times. If we didn't have perverts, women would be safe, right? They don't have to worry. But you know, when you get someone on the, the example I gave last time, he's carrying this tasbih with a bead up to here, right? And he goes, subhanallah, subhanallah, and a blonde comes, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. <laughs> huh? But keep with subhanallah, why are you shifting the mood? Huh? Keep subhanallah and stay away from that. Honor your dignity and modesty. Why are you perving on the dignity of other people? Respect other people's dignity. By chance God will respect your dignity. What gives you the right to hit at someone else's honor and sharaf and dignity? Huh? Protect your dignity. Allah says today, I was telling our sisters in the lecture of the afternoon, the Prophet said what? He said, the Prophet said, Man affa an shay'in bil haram, man lakahu allahu lahu bil halal. Whoever refrains from haram, God will give him the same thing in halal. The same thing. But do it for the sake of Allah. Say, Ya Allah, I don't want to touch it. Huh? Allah will give you something in halal. He will substitute it to you somehow in your life in a halal way. As we've been saying, it is only faith in the existence of an eternal being who knows man equally from within and without and who has full control over him that cultivates these virtues within man and impels him or her to automatic righteousness and adherence to duty. It is that system inside you. As Rasulullah or the, uh, Imam Ali says, that God has sent you with two things, with an internal messenger and external messenger. As for your internal messenger, it's your heart, it's your mind, it's your intelligence. The external <laughs> messenger is the prophets who come to synchronize the two together. How beautiful is that? How beautiful that Allah gives you the ability without any problem to identify but the wrong, but then it corroborates it with that in eternal being which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep you always in watch over yourself. The well-known philosopher and historian, Well Durant, says in his book, Pleasures of Philosophy, that without the backing of religion, this guy is not a Muslim, 
Huh? He says, without the backing of religion, morality is nothing more than rationalization, as without it, the sense of obligation disappears. The sense of obligation disappears, because nothing there to oblige you. Right? Once that authority goes away, you are at liberty to do anything. But the authority of Allah does not disappear. Because you know what? Even if you don't pay regard to the authority of Allah, He will get you. Whether you like it or not. Even if He gave you ample chances in this world, He will get you. Huh? All those tyrants who were above ground are now escaping underground. Right? Saddam. Gaddafi. Huh? Abdullah Saleh of Yemen. Huh? They're tyrants. They're tyrants. They didn't escape with their money huh? from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It couldn't protect them. It couldn't come to rescue them. No. Allah said, I will give you chances because I love you. I don't want to lose you. But it is you who can make that decision of coming back. Not me. Not me. It's up to you. Secondly, the second reason why we need you know, the uh, religion. Power to endure adversities of life. How? Religion provides power for facing adversities and serves as a bulwark against undesirable reactions of despair and hopelessness. When you have faith in Allah, you will never give up till the last minute. Why? Right? Because the power of prayer sustains you. And I will show you with statistics, with numbers, how the power of prayer sustains you. A religious person with firm belief in God does not find himself or herself in utter desperation, even in the worst moment of his life, because he knows or she knows well that he or she is under the protection of a being who is almighty who does not give up on you. He may try you, but he does not turn his back on you. With faith in the fact that every problem can be solved and every deadlock can be what? Can be resolved with God's help. He or she can overcome every disappointment and hopelessness. For this very reason, it is very seldom happened that a truly religious man suffers from the acute reaction of desperation like suicide, nervous breakdown or psychic ailments which are products of frustration and defeatism. The Quran says what? Surely those who are close to Allah have no fear, nor shall they grieve. لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون they shall not grieve or feel that fear. Imam Ja'far al-Sahrib says what? A true believer cannot commit suicide. Yet in Sweden, I think, which is the most affluent of the societies in Europe, the highest rate of suicide is in Sweden. Guess what? Where is the lowest rate of suicide in the world? This is what? This is the most affluent society has what has the highest rate of suicide the most impoverished society in the world has the lowest rate of what suicide where somalia <laughs> somalia the most downtrodden huh the, man these people are hit with famine day in and day out yet not one single one of them thinks of committing suicide why because there is religion, there is faith, and we will see how faith takes you into that horizon and launches you into that safety path. Thus religion, faith, religious faith is on the one hand a motivating force and on the other it is a factor which enables man to face hardship with courage and saves him from the ill effects of failure and disappointment. Following the downfall of the Nazis, Bernard Russell says the following, there existed a danger of intellectual and ideological revolt in Germany, but no doubt religion has been one of the biggest factors in that country's return to stability. Here we're talking about any religion. 
let alone the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The one that has the truth attached to it. Any religion, and then according to Dr. Durant again, behavior of a man who is not blessed with reliance on religious on religion suffers from special epicurean confusion and the life which has no comforting support of religion is an unbearable burden this guy is a psychologist he's not your average butcher on the street Tarik Road. he knows what he's talking about he made his studies and research about religion one of the most renowned psychologists in contemporary america today his name is Thomas More, author of the best-selling book called Care of the Soul. He says what? He says the great melody of the 21st century or 20th century when he wrote his book is loss of soul. The loss of soul when people don't pay regard to their spirit, to their soul, they become the greatest problem to themselves. To themselves, not to others, to themselves. According to two separate studies conducted at Duke University Center for Religion, Spirituality and Health, each study involving 4,000 participants, it was found that those who consider themselves to lead spiritual lives tend to have, number one, lower blood pressure. <laughs> SubhanAllah. Nothing that pushes them to the end. Nothing angers them. Nothing, you know, ah, if one day I could bash my head. No, there is no need for that. Because they have the what? The safety net of religion. And then he says, half as likely to suffer from depression to those who are not spiritual. Subhan, who paid this guy? Shir Jihad paid him to make this study? Huh? So that I can prove religion is right? Ah, nothing to do. I don't know the man. I don't know the man. I come across his book on one of my flights to the United States. In fact, more than 250 studies at Yale, Dartmouth, and other universities have found that people with all sorts of spiritual belief benefit from the following. A stronger immune system, making them less prone to catch colds and develop other illnesses. Lower rates of heart diseases, emphysemia, diabetes, cancer, and suicide. The greater mental and physical ability to deal with illness and recover faster. How? Allah will show you. He, because he's not just making statements, right? He says, I'll tell you what. How, you may ask, is the answer. He says, during a stressful situation, and please lend me your attentiveness for the next five minutes only, and then I'm done. And then I'm done. This psychologist says what, and this university studies at Dartmouth and Yale University, which are full of ah, top-ranking doctors, they say what? They say during a stressful situation, the adrenaline glands flood the body with chemicals that raise heart rate and blood pressure. Praying, meditating, and reading uplifting literature appear to lower those chemical levels and prevent stress from harming the body. Okay? Look what Allah says. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ala bi dhikrillahi tatma'innu al-qurub Surely with the remembrance of Allah the hearts are overcome with tranquility Tranquility? This is science man! We're not talking about just God telling us because he's the creator of science He said when you remember me you come back to your normal state Huh? You come back? Your normal state. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa says, when you get angry, go and perform wudu. Imam Ali says, if you are angry and you're standing, sit down. If you are sitting down, lie down and remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Immediately you would see your adrenaline glands coming back into balance. Because now what? The mention of Allah override these chemical reactions. Override this chemical reaction. Encounter with ideological vacuum. This is point number three. I have to stop and pass my time. Huh? This way I can keep you in suspense till tomorrow. All right? So all of you can also come inshallah. May Allah bless you. May Allah make us realize the importance 
I, you know what? Wallah, I can affiliate with our youth and our youngsters and most people who are disenchanted with religion. You know what? Because Wallah, I swear on the book of Allah, the religion we have been taught is not the religion that the Prophet brought into this world. Huh? In many of the situations we've been taught wrong what Allah wants from us. That's why we say, wow, I don't want to know this faith. I don't want to know this religion. But when you come to encounter such pure versions of what, not versions, not the other ones, the differences, huh? The, when you come to uh, understand the different aspects of the faith, you will know exactly how valuable Islam is to us and how much we are at loss if we disengage ourselves from the purified teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad salawatullahi wa salamu alayhim ajma'in. Before I conclude, if that young beautiful girl, Fatima her name, who was, uh, if she's here, I just want to see her for a minute after the lecture, inshallah. Wassalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.